All right, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? I need your help. I need your help. We are really, we, we always talk about that we are one church, many locations, but uh, this is a very uh, uh, involved message with all campuses. So I need you to welcome, would you welcome them for me? Would you, first of all, just, just welcome Etiwana Gardens into our midst here. Love you guys. Love you guys. One of the most beautiful campuses uh, out there in the Fontana Rancho area, and also uh, Lone Hill, uh, just up the road. Welcome them. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right. I want you to turn in your Bibles to one verse of Scripture. It's Romans 8, verse 13. I'm going to read it in a moment. Romans 8, 13. And we're in a series called Renovation, and here's what we basically said, that there's a calling on your life and mine to pursue holiness and purity and Christ's likeness in our lives. We said that there's got to be a bridging of the gap between what we say we believe in private and how we live our lives in public. And if our country has any hope at all, it's that Christ's followers begin to live out the life they say that they believe internally. So much so that there's a clear distinction between the Christ follower and the non-Christ follower that would be so compelling to people who don't yet know Jesus that they would at least want to consider the worldview that Jesus came to bring. And so to do that, we've said there's a little battle going on in our lives. Last week we had a fun time, didn't we? We talked about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and we said each of us have two different people in our lives. We have the virtuous self, the righteous, self-righteous, religious self, that really isn't that virtuous at all because this kind of guy is religious. He does all of these rituals and, and, and he prays a certain direction or does a certain amount of good works because he thinks by doing so, God will owe him salvation. And this guy is the narcissistic selfish self and he doesn't want anything to do with God or the law or religion. And we said that all of us have both these two selves in us before we are born again. So both of these are equally us. Not one is more us than the other. Both of these, we are equally these two people, the virtuous religious guy and the narcissistic rebel against God guy. But we also said that this is the guy ultimately who ends up winning because the flesh and the power of this old man in us is, is so powerful that he is able to overcome to such a degree that the Bible describes us as being slaves to this guy, slaves that we have a master. But then the Bible says that you and I are born again. And when we're born again, something beautiful happens. This is the new us. And this guy is mortally wounded, the bad guy. But we have to do business with this guy, too, to let him know that we know we're accepted by God on the basis of what? Grace. We are saved by grace through our faith in what has already been done for us. And at that point, we're no longer two distinct people in one. We are now one person. And in Galatians 2.20, we're told this, and I'll come back to Romans 8.13. Actually, let me go ahead and read Romans 8.13 says this, that if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. Let me say it again. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. Now, the new man has a new battle. The old battle was between these two guys, but there's, that's not the battle anymore. The battle now is between the new us, and in Galatians 2.20, we're told, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not the battle between these two guys. There is a battle. It's not going from, from war to peace. It's still war. But the war now is between the real us. See, in the old battle, both of these are the real us. But now there's only one real us. The real us that wants to do the good. The real us that delights in the law. And the reason we delight in the law is the law is the way we please. Not appease, but please God. And we want to please God because we've been born again and we're able to see all the goodness that God's brought into our lives. We know we're not saved by the law. We're no longer a slave to it. Now Jesus Christ lives in us. And because Christ lives in us, the battle now is between the real us and this flesh. We are a new person incarcerated in in the body of flesh. And so now the temptations of the flesh are going to try to overcome he who is in us. But we're told that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And so what I want to do in this very practical message quickly, and I've got to move quickly because I want to do something fantastic at the end of it. 
And I'm going to ask Etowan and Gardens, Lone Hill, all of us together to stay involved here because we're going to do it on every campus, and I'm going to lead you through it. I wanted to come up, not come up, that's a bad word. I wanted to see what the Bible said. How can we defeat now, since we really do desire to be the people God wants us to be, and we have all these temptations in the flesh, we're incarcerated in this flesh, it holds us back because of its desires. How can we win the battle? In this old battle, you can't win. You just can't. You have no power. But now we have power through the power of God living his life. The, the Christ lives in us. It's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. We now have the power. How can we overcome? How can we win this battle? And I believe the Bible gives you eight steps to this victory. I know you, you seldom hear Pastor Jeff say, eight steps? I'm not a formula guy. I'm not an acrostic dude. But this series has been pulling stuff out of me. And I want to race through these quickly. If you ever hope to win this battle and to become the person God wants you to become, and first let me say, if you have no passion to become the person Christ wants you to become, we've got to go back all the way before you were born again. If there's no real passion in you to be holy, to pursue purity, and to be different, and to be compelling, and to be like Christ, then that's because you've not been born again yet. Because when you're born again, that's the automatic thing that happens. He not only changes what you do, he changes what you want to do. There's a new passion, new desire in you. Now, here are the steps. Number one, you've got, first of all, acknowledge that you're in a war, man. You're in a fight for your life. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control lest after preaching to others I may myself be disqualified. What? I can't believe that the Apostle Paul would talk about being disqualified. What's he saying? He said, if I don't, if I don't beat my body, if I don't get this flesh in check, then I will be disqualified from preaching the good news of the gospel because when I preach it, no one will believe it because it's had no impact on me. So there's got to be an impact on me. He said, and I'm in a war, man. And I've got to acknowledge that I'm in a war and it's a daily one against this flesh. Now let me just take a time out here. God gave you God-given desires. The point is that because you know and acknowledge that they're from God, that he also gave you legitimate means to fulfill every desire. It's when you start trying to fulfill these desires by illegitimate means and step out of the parameters God's given that then the flesh takes over and you're ruled by it and that brings death and destruction. So the first thing you've got to realize, man, is you're in a battle for your life. And if there are no spiritual disciplines in your life, if there's no daily Bible reading, if there's no pursuit for purity, if you think you can just drift into a life of purity, sooner or later, you're going to be doomed. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, I stretch and I strain, I forget what's behind me, and I keep marching forward with everything that I am to pursue Christ's likeness in my life. Now, here's the point he's making. I think you've heard me tell the story. One of the most uh, prideful, arrogant demonstrations that I can ever remember in my life was when I was playing a basketball in university and we were playing one of the top 15 teams in the country and they came to our place, the coach was so arrogant about their ability and because we were in a lesser division that he started his second string against us. And I mean, by the end of the first quarter, we were up 20 points and he was angry and he was yelling at the players. By halftime, he decided to put in the first string, but it was too late. We already had momentum, the crowd was in it. He did a Bobby Knight and threw the chair out on the floor and got kicked out of the game. And then at the end of the game, you could hear him yelling in the locker room because we won the game. And he was berating his players, but it wasn't the player's fault. It was his fault for underestimating, severely underestimating his opponent, which means he didn't prepare for us during the week, which means he wasn't prepared in game time. I'm telling you, the first thing the Bible reminds you of is that if you think you're not in a battle and you think you can just drift into this, you will lose. You will not win this battle over the flesh. Second, remind yourself that the old sinful you is decidedly already dead. Now, once you acknowledge you're in a battle, once at least you're honest with yourself, then the second thing, ironically, is you're supposed to remember that this guy has been mortally wounded. You've got power in you now, power to overcome sin and death. This guy's mortally, but you can wake him up. And let me give you this kind of analogy here. I want you to look at a few photos. This is you against sin now, but you're the big one. Look at this. This is you. This is the power that you have. Uh, my friend John Ortberg tells a story, and I think I've told it numerous times, where some pastors invited him downtown L.A., and uh, he went downtown L.A. They find themselves in Los Angeles late at night, and then they met up with some other guys who invited them into a, 
a place that he would rather not go, but he went in order to share the faith, share, his go- share the gospel, the good news, and he, uh, he's coming out of this place, downtown LA, bad part of Los Angeles, so you know it could happen, and it's about 1.30, 2 a.m. in the morning, and they, they just happen upon a fight that's happening. Actually, it's not a fight. It's three or four guys beating this other guy up. And as a pastor, Orberg says, I couldn't just stand there. How could I just stand there and let this happen? This guy was probably going to be beaten to an inch of his life. And so I don't know where it came from, but there was courage. And I just said, hey, you guys, knock it off. Now, can you imagine a pastor? Hey, you bad people, stop that. And he said the, the, the three or four thugs just looked at him. And then their eyes got real big, and they actually started backing up, and then they ran away. And Orberg said, I could not believe it. So I got even more brave, and I said, don't you do that again. <laughs> and so he said, you know, I got my chest out, and I'm thinking, man, I must look intimidating. Then he turns around, and he bumps into Mongo, who was a six foot eight, 280-pound bouncer from the place he just uh, exited. <laughs> they saw Mongo, not him. And Orberg makes the analogy that, hey, you know, if I'm that brave with Mongo behind me, how brave should I be knowing that God's right with me? So if I know that God is with me and that a mortal blow has been struck against this man of the flesh, the old self can no longer dominate. I'm not subject to him. He's subject to me. There is power in me. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Paul says it like this in Romans 6, 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin, the body of sin, not the spirit, it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us, but the body, the flesh, this body of sin might be brought to nothing. In other words, he would be weakened so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. There's greatness in all of us. Someone greater than Mongo is living in, on the inside of us, and we have the power. Once you acknowledge that you're in a war and you take it seriously, then you've got to remind yourself, however, the old guy's dead. There's power in me to overcome no matter what it is, no matter how long I've been doing it, no matter how much I think it's stuck to me like Velcro, there's power in the Spirit of God to overcome. Third, you've got to develop more hatred for sin. Now, I know if you're a seeker or you're new to CCV, you might be here and you're thinking, you know what, Pastor, I I was invited here and I'm glad, or maybe you're listening online and you're thinking, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really believe in all this sin stuff. Uh, My first comment to you would be, yes, you do. And you would say, don't tell me what I believe. And you would say, no, I think people have their own system of right and wrong, but there's no real sin, you know. I think people make mistakes. No, you don't. A mistake is when you move the decimal point too far. It's when you forget to carry the two, that that's a mistake. Let me give you a visual of what you know sin, even if you're not willing to admit it, does in our world. Sin in our world causes things like the Holocaust, where you've got death camps where people slaughter one another, and gas ovens where we throw little children into them before they have a chance at life. Uh, Sin causes things like the Rwandan genocide, where there are bodies in rivers and gorges where friends pick up machetes and kill friends. That's what sin does. Sin causes human trafficking, where you've got humans sold into slavery and loaded up on cargo ships and and shipped to different parts of the world and sold for a price. Sin causes the Twin Towers and people flying planes in them in the name of God. That's not in the name of God. That's in the name of sin. The taking the lives of the innocent. Sin in our world causes starvation. Little children dying before they have a chance at life. And it's not because there's not enough resources in our world. We've got enough resources in the world to feed the world ten times over. It's that we mismanage it because of our pride and because of our egotism and because of our greed. That's, what, that's a visual of what sin causes. What the Bible tells you is even though that's noticeable, what you don't notice is when you live according to the flesh, what you are doing is the same kind of death and disintegration that happens on planet Earth as a result of sin is happening in your soul. You may not notice it on the outside, but you are killing yourself. There's a tarnishness, there's a disintegration. You may think you're getting away with it for a season, but ultimately, The longer you participate in it, the more it is killing you on the inside. You're emotional. There's fear. There's anxiety. There's worry. There's doubt. All of these things start to happen inside you that destroy you from the inside out. And as you get older, you start to wonder why there's such a sense of of dissatisfaction and of worry and of doubt and of fear. You're almost gripped and overwhelmed with what is yet to come. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 13 again, for if you live according to the flesh... 
If you just respond every time the flesh wants something in illegitimate fashion, you're going to die. And that's a physical, emotional, psychological death, all are included in the word. But if by the Spirit, by he who is in you, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. One of my favorite uh, works of art, actually, and literature comes from Oscar Wilde, believe it or not. Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray was an incredibly handsome young man. And the artist asked him to paint his portrait. And when Dorian saw it, he became enamored, almost enraptured with his own good looks. And he starts to dream a little bit. So he wistfully intones about how wonderful it would be if somehow he could live any way he pleased, but that no disfigurement would mar his own countenance, that the lawless life that he wanted to live, the debauchery, somehow he could live it, and it wouldn't mar his countenance, but instead all the marks would go to the painting. If only the portrait could grow old and he could remain unscathed by his way of living. And if you know the story and the parable, years later Dorian goes up to the attic to take a look at the painting. He's shocked by what he sees, the horror, the hideousness, and the blood marred the painting of now what he truly looked like. Did we show you a photo of that? There it is. When the artist who painted Dorian Gray saw what had happened to the painting, he begged Dorian Gray, he said, come clean, man. Doesn't it say somewhere, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow? And then in a fit of rage to silence the voice of conviction, Dorian Gray murders the artist. And then he takes the same knife and he slashes the painting to remove any visible reminder of the wicked life he's living. And what happened is, rather than the painting coming to an end, the painting at that point was fully restored, and Dorian Gray lay on the ground completely disfigured that he was so unrecognizable at his funeral that even his friends didn't know who he was. What is the point of this parable by Oscar Wilde? Well, the point is this. We may not always see what's going on in your life on the outside, but rest assured, when you're living by the flesh and outside the parameters God has given you and you're missing the mark by sin, you are destroying yourself every day on the inside. There's destruction. There's going to be debilitation and disintegration of the soul so that you get to a point when you're so far away from God, you're so far deep in the darkness that even when you see the light, it's hard to find your way back. You gotta make war. You gotta take this seriously. And you've got to know that just because you can't see anything on the outside doesn't mean something, the disintegration is not occurring on the inside. Four, refuse to be bullied by sins, deceits, and manipulations. The Apostle Paul says in, Eph in Ephesians chapter four, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. What is a deceitful desire? Now, as a Christ follower, you're supposed to gain in your knowledge and understanding here. What, what does it mean, a deceitful desire? Well, it's a desire that you have that's trying to deceive you. Remember what we said. You have desires that are God-given. And for every desire that God gives you, he gives you a way to fulfill it that is godly, that is legitimate. Let's take intimacy. Let's take sex. There is a way. God gave you that desire, and there is a legitimate and an illegitimate way to fulfill it. And it's in the context of marriage with the one to whom you're married. And so what happens? Sin deceives you. It tells you, wait a minute, you can, you can have this now. And what you end up doing, like Esau, you sacrifice your future for the pleasure of the present. A young girl settles for a man she knows will not lead her spiritually. And as she grows closer to God, she draws further away from her husband. They start to argue over the kids. Should we read the Bible to them? No, we shouldn't do that. We'll let them make up their own mind. We don't want to force religion down them. And then they start arguing about finances. She wants to give to something outside of herself. He wants to hoard. They talk about leisure, how they spend their free time. Do they serve others or do they serve themselves? A man decides to cheat. This one time, maybe on his taxes or maybe at work or something. But suddenly it becomes the norm of how to get ahead. So it's made him a false promise. It can never deliver what ultimately it promises because sooner or later you get caught. 
And then he loses credibility with his friends and with his workplace. Then he finds it difficult to get a job, sometimes never get a job again. And he never meant for it to happen, but it always ends like this. Always. Sooner or later. The Bible says, God is not mocked. Your sins will find you out. A young girl makes a decision to try this drug for the first time. She tells herself that she'll be able to quit any time. And she immediately gets the approval of the group with which she wants to identify. But then she wakes up one day and she realizes it's got her. It's got her. She doesn't have it. And it's killing her on the inside and the outside with every passing day. There's a young man and he's going to click on a website. Just out of curiosity, he can stop whenever he wants. And then all of a sudden he finds himself thinking about it all day. His heart races. His pulse quickens on the way home to his private room. Suddenly he finds himself being awakened in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., and he turns the light on, fires up the computer. And he gets to a point where his sense of intimacy is so warped, he wonders if he can ever have a normal relationship with any girl. When he started out, he thought it was going to be okay. He wanted this instantaneous fulfillment. But the deceit of sin is it tells you, I promise you this, and it never delivers. It does deliver. It delivers death. Gary Richmond talks about an experience he had at the zoo with a 13-foot cobra whose venom could kill a thousand people. This particular snake had a scar above its left eye that made it look like the embodiment of evil. And so when the snake shed its skin, the skin would get stuck, it would get caught on the scar, and it would have to be removed by hand. And he says the trouble with snakes is that they don't have hands. So five people have to go in to the cage. Two keepers, one curator, one veterinarian, and then Gary. Gary Richmond, who writes the story. He says, the snake slithers out from its den. It spreads its cape, raises up to full stature, looks at the five intruders, and then decides on his first victim, and it just so happens to be the curator, the guy they need the most. And all of a sudden he speaks and he says, man, let's get this over with quickly. And they throw this black net over him or, or cloth to blind him. As they're sitting there trying to remove this skin, their hands are trembling, sweat dropping off of their foreheads. Gary looks down and notices he has a cut. And this snake is releasing venom that the towel is becoming nothing but venom. And he's afraid it's going to touch his skin because it, here's a venom that can drop an elephant just like that. So they're all sweating. His muscles are weakening. Fingers are starting to cramp as they're holding this thing together. And then suddenly when they finally remove the skin, the curator says something very interesting. He says, you know what? More people are bitten when they're trying to let go of snakes than they are when they first grab on. <laughs> Easy to grab, hard to let go. Can you say that with me? Easy to grab, hard to let go. That's the thing of sin, man. It tells you that you can do this this one time, but you can't. Easy to grab, hard to let go. You've got to take the posture in your life of never opening the door. Refuse to be bullied by its deceits. L listen, if it's 3 a.m. in the morning and somebody knocks on your door and you peep out the peephole and you see that they've got a bandana and a gun, are you going to open the door? Probably not. That's the language the Bible uses. Look, you know what's going on here. Don't open the door. Number five, declare a radical allegiance to the other side. Declare a radical allegiance to the other side. A friend of mine, I, at least he says he's a friend of mine, sent me this email this week. Can you believe this? This is what he said. <laughs> now that's just cold, man. That's just cold. That's just downright cold. And uh, most of us know that Dodger fans and Giants fans don't get along that well, don't we? They, don't, they have a real disdain for one another. Uh, Cowboys and Steeler fans, they have a disdain too. And I understand this one because I grew up a Cowboy fan. And the, the reason we hate, and I know it's a strong word, disdain the Steelers is because they took Super Bowls away from us. Forget they were better, but we still are angry. And we don't give up very easily. But I had no idea until I started reading in preparation for the playoffs. I had no idea. I don't know, call me stupid, call me ignorant, I don't know. I just did not know the hatred that the Cubs and Cardinals have for each other. Oh my goodness, you got no idea. 
This hatred is unbelievable. This next slot is the one I really like. I don't often hate, but when I do, I prefer to hate the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> Most of these would never have anything whatsoever to do with the other side because they have a radical allegiance to their team. A Dodger fan would never wear a Giants jersey into Dodger Stadium because you shall surely die. <laughs> a Giants fan would never order a bunch of Dodger dogs and sell them at a game up in San Francisco as Dodger dogs. You say, what's your point? Here's the point. It's very difficult to hang out with the devil for two weeks and then rebuke him on the third week. It's insane to think you can walk in step with the wicked then experience victory in the way of the righteous. It's, it's downright impossible to hang out with evil on Monday to Friday then expect to dwell in the house of the Lord on Sunday. It's foolish to delight in idolatry on Friday night then expect to find satisfaction in true worship on Sunday morning. It's impossible to plant your tree in the desert and expect to find streams of living water. This is a radical allegiance that we have, and there's no compromise. I can't for the life of me understand why I'm meeting men today, and they feel quite comfortable in dropping the F-bomb as a Christ follower. And it's their way of saying, well, we're men, we're tough, we're saved by grace through faith, so I can do whatever I want. You've got to be kidding me, guys. Really? Let me read to you a little section of Ephesians 5 in light of what I just said. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Among you there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, but he doesn't stop there, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. Those Greek words put together mean no word that either has no meaning or that is slain. You with me? None of that, which are out of place. But if you're going to talk, talk about thanksgiving. For you were once in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do, nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So a real man would walk up to another man who confesses to be a Christian and say, dude, that language, let me ask you something. Would Jesus drop the F-bomb? Was Jesus any less a man? He's the real man, man. He takes the sins of the world to the cross. Please. Come on. We're pursuing holiness and purity, man. And freedom does not mean autonomy. Freedom means that we're free from the law, free to do the things that the law requires, but do it in a way of grace and pleasing God, not appeasing. Know the spirit of the age, number six. Almost done. Stay with me. Know the spirit of the age. Any of you remember Gary Hart? Some of you will. He was a U.S. senator in Colorado from 75 to 1987. He sought the Democratic nominee for president in 84 and 88. There can be no doubt, if you know your Democratic history here, he was on the rise to become president. He had a double-digit lead over his nearest competitor in the Democratic nomination. And then the rumors of an affair with Donna Rice hit the pages of the media. Even though no one really ever proved or substantiated every, anything, he had to step out of the race. The rumors were enough in that time of the life of our country because in those days, we believed that what one does in private impacts how one will lead in public. And then Bill Clinton came along. <laughs> now. Do not think this is a political argument. This is not. It's just an example I'm trying to use right now. Because Bill Clinton lied, manipulated, cheated, was an adulterer within the White House, but it really didn't matter to the Americans because we had changed, we had evolved, we had thrown away the shackles of moral law. And besides, everybody does it. And in his own words, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. You can become desensitized by the culture that you're in, failing to understand what pleases God, and you start to live like the world lives, but you are a people, remember what we said? You're more interested in JC than PC, right? 
So even if something is PC and it's not JC, Jesus Christ, you follow the way of Jesus. Even if something is readily accepted in our culture today, but if it offends Christ, you go his way. The world, who's the prince of the power of the air? The world is always going to move away from God, not toward him. It's the world system in which we live. But you and I stay the course. And if you don't remember the spirit of the age that you're in, you can become desensitized and start to go the way of the world. And if that's what you do, you can never put to death the flesh. I said a few weeks ago that our time is coming, that we're going to be persecuted like so many other Christians around the world have been persecuted for generations. It'll be coming to America. Why? Because we believe that sex is between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. We believe that life in the womb is sacred. We believe the Bible is the moral point of reference. We believe that what one does in private impacts what one does in public. We believe that marital faithfulness is honorable. And because we stand for those types of things, they are going to hate us and want to silence the shackles of morality that the church brings. And in our world, we are in a time when the fences of decency are being moved every year. And before you think that you're in good standing with God, even though you've crossed the moral border, you've got to wake up to the reality that if you're not careful, you'll become desensitized by a culture moving away from God and you'll start to think like they think. That's why the Bible warns you time and time again. Think about it. In the greatest theological treaties ever written, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Just sometime, those of you who like to study scripture, just look at that from every side. Because he says, don't be conformed. And he uses the word suscomitizo. Do not be conformed. And what suscomitizo means is this. Don't allow an outer shell to be visible in such a way to contradict who you truly are on the inside. That's an amazing word, isn't it? So in other words, we know who we are. The real us, we know who that is. So he says, don't let your outer shell betray who you truly are on the inside. Don't be conformed. He says, but be transformed. Metamorpho, or metamorpho, which is metamorphosis. And that word means, let the outside, let the inside escape into the outside to become the real you on the outside that you are on the inside. It's the whole process of a, a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. The real, he's always a butterfly. And the real him gets out and begins to look like what he truly is on the inside. And he says you do that by renewing your mind, which is a Greek word that means to adjust your vision. But it's a, a word that means adjust your vision and keep on adjusting your vision. He's saying if you don't keep on doing this all the time, you will drift, you will slide. And so here's what I ask you, very practical. If you're serious about this, what music do you listen to? What books are you reading? Are you in a rooted group? You say, you mean, you mean, you mean if I'm not in a rooted group, I'm not going to heaven? No. <laughs> but are you in a group of accountability? What do you spend your time thinking about? What kind of friends have you chosen? All of this is part of God's way to constantly make you aware and to renew your mind and to adjust your vision to see things as God sees. Someone said, the ship belongs in the water of the world, but if the water gets in, the ship sinks. You can't saturate your mind with the enemy's philosophy and then be expected to live by the code of the king. You with me? Now here's the end, and I want you to wake up. It really is the last page. You've got one page, but I can get a lot in a page. Etiwana Gardens, Lone Hill, right here together now, okay? These last two will bring it together. And I really encourage you, it would take me too long to keep going over and over. I really encourage you to listen to this message again and write down these principles and put them somewhere just to remind yourself because these are scriptural. This isn't the sermon according to Jeff. These are the scriptures that teach me these principles. Number seven, do not open the door for sin's entry. Now we're getting serious. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So if you're serious about the battle, you're going to close the door before it ever opens, and you're never going to put yourself in a position where the thief may come in and destroy. I had a youth pastor in New Zealand, I've said this before, named Bill Kirshner. Bill came to me, he was getting close to his 30s, and he said, Pastor Jeff, as you know, I'm single, 
and I'm not married. I really want to be married, and I'm, I'm dating a lot more than I ever had, and uh, I just want, I want to make an accountability with you. I, I want us to make an agreement that every time I go out on a date, that after that date, I have to call you, and that you will promise to ask me if I behaved Christ-like with this girl, and if I know that after every date I have to call you, it's going to help me to be strong. And he would often quote the verse out of Job that says this, 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And Bill would call me after every date, and I would ask him the questions. He also said, I'm not ever going to bring her back to my apartment where we're alone. No way. We're always going to be in public. We can date, we can walk in the park, but we're always going to be where people can see us. Don't have a computer, guys, in your private place. Have it in the open. Don't have a porn channel, guys. If it comes with a package, cancel it. Don't spend hours talking to her in the parking lot after work because you're not married to her. Don't meet privately with him, ladies, for business discussions. If he wants to meet privately, you demand that you meet somewhere where the door's open or in a cafe somewhere where he's accountable. Romans 13, 14 says, make no provision for the flesh. Now, here's the thing about this guy. He, he's mortally wounded, but you can wake him up. Because if you put yourself in positions where sin can resurrect, you know what he does? Whoa, somebody opened the door. Something's going on here. I feel like I'm getting new life, resurrected. Woo, look at this. Let a sleeping dog lie. Don't give him a foothold. There's a story that I've been hearing a lot pastors are using. It's actually a, a plagiarism from a Aesop's fable. Uh, call the farmer and the viper. And the story, the modern day parable is a little different, but it goes like this. A woman hits a snake with a car. She feels pity. She nourishes him back to a full state of health. And after she does that, the snake promptly bites her, injects her with poison. And as she lay dying, she looks at the snake and says, how could you do this after all I've done for you? And his response is, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. <laughs> you get it? Yeah. What are you considering picking up that you think won't bite you? It will. I promise. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but the death and disintegration that's happening on the inside will go to the outside. And then finally, remind yourself that the enemy has the goods on you. This is so important. Four minutes and I'm done, okay? I want to give credit where credit is due here because I learned, this, cha this passage changed my life in my 30s and it was by John MacArthur. I heard a message when he came to New Zealand and I also read his commentary on this section because I was so interested in his take on it. In James, we're told, let me read it to you. It's the word that will not return void, so rather than summarize, let me read it. He says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The, the, the structure of the Greek in verse 14, when it talks about by their own evil desire and enticed, is James' way of saying this to you, that the devil has the goods on you. That he knows your personal weakness. And that's what he's going to hone in on. And just when you think you're starting to make progress, isn't it amazing? If you have an addiction of some kind, you're going along, everything's good, 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 boom, out of nowhere, you're put in a position. You think that's by accident. My father, uh, I think I've told this before, when we lived up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he came to see his grandson, which would have been Delaney at that time, he drives all the way from Tennessee to Cincinnati, he, we don't even make it to the apartment to see Delaney, because we stop at the Brandy Chase apartment office, and he starts talking to the manager, because there was this big pond out in front of the apartments, and there was a sign, and evidently, uh, the sign said something to do with who can catch old Sam. And so the manager of the apartment said, yeah, we got, a, we got a, a carp, we got a catfish in there that's wreaking havoc on our pond, and nobody can catch him. Well, my dad's from Tennessee. And, you know, if you open the trunk of my car, you're going to have golf clubs and golf shoes and golf balls and golf gloves, everything golf. You just open it up. It's like, a, it's like a golf smith in the back of my car. 
You open my dad's trunk, it's like Bass World. Every fishing rod and reel and lure you could ever imagine. My dad, with a big smile on his face, walks over to the trunk, gets out a can of corn and a favorite lure, and he walks over to the edge. And he pours the, he holds the corn in and pours the juice out in a certain part of the, just leaning over. And then he, uh, then he pours some corn on top, and then he puts his favorite hook on, and he throws it in. I bet you it, I'll, I guarantee it couldn't have been more than three minutes that he had old Sam up on the pole. And he held it up. By this time, there's a little crowd out there, and they're, yeah, yeah. At which point, my dad smiled and threw him back in. You got to know my dad. That's the point. I said, Dad, how'd you do this? He says, you just got to, he said, there's one bait that every fish can't resist. He's got the goods on you. And if you're aware that he's got the goods on you, when that thing that keeps destroying you comes, you're going you're gonna to get angry. And you're going to say, oh, you're oh, oh man. Because oh. what he wants you to do is fail so that he can remind you of your failure so you'll give up your Christian walk. Because he still operates by works of the law, not by grace. And when you learn what's really going on, and he reminds you of your past, you'll start reminding him of his future. That he may have the goods on you, but you got the goods on him, and he's going down. And he's just mad and trying to take as many with us, with him as possible. But you can stand strong. You can win. You can defeat the enemy. Here's what I want to do on all campuses. I want. I want to ask a big favor. We're going to end in a way that I think is just going to, it just needs to be done on all campuses right now at Etiwanda Gardens, at Lone Hill, and right here on San Dimas. If you are between the age of 15 and 30, I'm asking you to have the courage to get out of your chair right now and come stand right here on the front. I'm not going to do anything strange to you. You're not going to have to say anything. But I'm just going to give you a little challenge, okay? That's all. You don't have to be brave. Come on, Etiwanda Gardens, if you're between the age of 15 and 30, come right up here. Oh, yeah. That's so, come on now. Come on now. Lone Hill, you're in this too. Between the age of 15 and 30, right here. Between, look at how good looking these guys are. My goodness. 18 and 30, come right up here to the top. Come to the front. Etiwanda Gardens. Let me have this camera right here, Etiwanda Gardens. Etiwanda Gardens, between the age of 15 and 30. Don't be shy. Come on up. Chris will be there. Come on up. I'm going to lead you in this. At Lone Hill, same thing. Come on up between 15 and 30, and I want you to face me. I don't want you to face them. Face, face right here. Now, here's what I want to do with you. You're not going to have to say anything, do anything, but I wish to God that someone would have done for me what I'm about to do with you. I'm asking you not to say anything, but I'm asking you today, and it's not because we've given up on everybody out there, it, that's not why you're here, but to tell you the truth, most of the people out there, including myself, most of us, we learn this too late in life, so there has been a lot of disintegration internally, we have been sucked by the vortex of the world, and so there's a lot of damage that has happened in a lot of us, that now some of us are trying to deal with it with medication, or with some kind of philosophy, or or 12-step step program, and all those are good. Those are good things. But I want to save your, we want to save your generation from having to deal with a lot of what we've had to deal with because we didn't take the battle seriously. So I'm, I'm challenging, I'm just making a challenge, and some of you won't want to do this. You don't have to say a thing. But I'm challenging you to do three things in your life. One, I'm challenging you to saturate your mind with Scripture. I'm just challenging you that every day, even if it's one verse of Scripture, just one, during your lunch break, on your iPhone, iPad, just you don't even have to sit and study it. But if every day you'll put one verse of Scripture into your life, guess what's going to happen? As you get older and older, you're going to have so much in there, and the Spirit of God will activate it at the right time and right place and give you victory over the temptation. But if you, if you never do that and you keep putting it off like most of us did, then you'll just remain biblically illiterate, and the Spirit of God won't have any ammunition to help you fight this battle. So I'm just asking you, make a commitment at breakfast or lunch, one scripture, just one passage. Start in the book of John, read one verse. Start in the book of John, read one verse every day. If the Spirit leads you and you get interested, I want to read one, you know, just keep reading. Don't ever feel guilty if you miss. Don't feel like that way because that's the enemy. 
You don't stand in condemnation anymore for those who are in Christ Jesus. Make a commitment that you're going to saturate your mind with righteousness. Etiwana Gardens, young people who are standing right here before us, same thing. Make a commitment. One verse, Lone Hill, same thing. One verse a day. Two, young ladies and young men, commit to purity. I want to tell you something that my pastor never told me and that people won't tell you, okay? If you can wait till you're married to engage in sex, let me tell you what's going to happen. And you know, I, I, I'm a sinner. I got issues in my life, but this is one area of my life that I got right because I had a mom and dad that told me why that I was to wait until marriage. Okay, listen to me. So this is from experience, not only the Bible, but from experience. If you will wait until you're married and you will save yourself to give yourself to the one that enters into covenant with you, your intimacy is going to be off the charts. It's going to be, it's going to be like you never can. Here's why. Because you're going to learn together. And when you learn together and you give yourself to each other in a commitment of marriage, and you know there's no baggage behind you, and there's no husband wondering what it was like when you were with him, or no woman wondering what it was like when you were with her, it there brings such a freedom and a trust that the intimacy is off the charts. Look, I'm 52 years old, and I just want to tell you, the intimacy with my wife is off the charts, but it's because we both entered into this unscathed. I'm asking you right here at Etiwanda Gardens at Lone Hill that you would make a commitment, men and women, you would make a commitment. I don't care what you've done yesterday or the past, forget that, forget it, from here on out, that you're going to remain pure, that you're going to have the spirit overwhelm the flesh, and you're going to enter into intimacy in the context of marriage and until then you're not going to give yourself to a man or to a girl you're not going to give yourself to each other until you've made the covenant of marriage and third that you would commit to fight for your life if you will saturate your mind with scripture and you will remain pure and holy as best you can to the marriage ceremony and that you will fight this battle with God and you know you're in a battle. You, let me tell you, the problems and things that you're seeing out here, you will be able to escape so much of it. But if you just keep going the way everybody else is going, you're going to end up like everybody else has, has done. We've got 20% depression epidemic in our country. Anxiety is on, a, on the rise among your age group. If you, want, if, you, if you are really wanting healing internally and you want that peace and you want that sense of purpose and you want to know what God wants to do with you and you want to hear from God, remember what I said, you can't dance with the devil and then want to hear from God. No. No. Pursue God. And the more you pursue God and the more faithful you are to him, you're going to hear his voice. That's not audible, but you're going to recognize it when it comes. And there's going to be such a peace and certainty in you that you're going to be able to to live the life you've always wanted. I'm asking you to do those things. All right, now here's what I want. On this campus at Etiwana Gardens and Lone Hill, I want everybody now to stand on all campus. You guys stay here. Everybody stand. Etiwana, stand, please. Lone Hill, stand. And I want you to stretch out your hands, and I'm going to do the final thing that I wish a pastor would have done for me when I was your age. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing. Here we go. Here are the words that I want you to hear. Father in heaven, I pray that you would cause your face to shine on every person standing right here at San Dimas, at Etiwana Gardens, at Lone Hill. I pray that you would open their eyes right now to how much you do love them and how much indeed you want them to live the abundant life and how that you have given your precepts to us not to bind us but to free us to live a life that is not ruled by the flesh but is ruled by the Spirit of God in us. I pray you'd give them courage. I pray that you would help them to acknowledge that they are living in a world that is moving away from God, not toward you. And in doing so, that they would make a commitment to saturate their minds with the Word of God every day. They would make a commitment to remain sexually pure to the marriage day. And then, Father, that you would open their eyes that this is a battle. And I pray that they would, 
the, the 15 to 30 year olds at Etiwana Garden, the 15 to 30s at Lone Hill, the 15 to 30s right here, that they would remember, oh God, that they would remember this day that they heard the message, that they heard what you're willing to do when we follow you closely. And I pray that in this group before me right now on all campuses, I pray there would be presidents. I pray there would be doctors and lawyers and I pray there would be missionaries and preachers and teachers, but most importantly, I pray there would be Christ followers and that the way this generation follows Christ is so compelling that the next generation comes to you in droves because of their ministry and because of their transparency and because of how real they really are. It's all of our prayer in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Give them a round of applause for coming up. Thank you, guys.